Hey guys, welcome back to yet another episode of Top Billers Toolkit, where me and my twin brother interview top billers from all around the globe to unlock the secrets to their success. Today's guest is James Osborne. James has been working in recruitment for over 20 years and has helped some of the biggest organizations in the world. He's now the co-founder of the Recruitment Network, a huge community of recruiters who are dedicated to helping one another improve, grow, and stay at the top of their game. He's trained hundreds of different recruiters across countless industries. So when it comes to knowledge and insight about the recruitment world, James is your go-to man. Today, we're gonna to be speaking about the current trends that James is seeing in the market. We'll discuss what the best recruitment companies are doing right now to stay ahead of the game. We're gonna cover specific BD strategies that are getting great results for recruiters right now. We'll also talk about the one mindset hack that James has used throughout his entire career to stay motivated and help him bill vast sums of money. So as usual, you lovely people, grab a cuppa or a glass of wine, depending on when you're listening to this. And let's get into it, shall we? Hello, James. How are you, my friend? I'm good, Sam. Very good. Thank you. How are you doing? Yeah, very good. Thank you, mate. Thank you for joining us on Top Billers Toolkit. Uh, me and Ben have known of you for many years on LinkedIn. I know you're... Um, very much embedded in the recruitment world and you're big on building communities especially with trn network um i know you're doing big and great things with that um so i wanted to have you on because i know you have a lot of wisdom and knowledge in this area so thanks for joining us no thank you yeah i mean i pretty much live and breathe the recruitment world so it's my life um day in day out night in night out as well i love it i love the industry i think it's an amazing industry yeah uh, a lot going on at the moment though interesting time so it's I think it's good to have these sort of sessions that you're running, that things that you're doing, because it gives people a good chance to just get a sense of what the hell's going on and what other people are up to. Definitely, useful. mate. Yeah. And glad to have you here. Cool. So the starting question is, um, what would you say is the number one tool in your toolkit, James, whether it be a mindset, a strategy or a piece of software? What do you think? Yeah. It's a really interesting question, right? Because uh, there's so many tools that you could use as a recruiter at your disposal and many of them are brilliant. Um, to me, it always comes back into the mindset, always has done. If I look at the difference between a, a, an average recruiter and a great recruiter, someone who's killing it, someone who's not getting it at all, it all comes down to attitude and mindset. The process of recruitment is not that complicated if you follow it. Um, mm. And the mindset to me comes, I break it down into two things and two things I live by personally. I suppose one is optimism. So mm. you wake up in the morning, you choose to be a pessimist or you choose to be an optimist. I personally choose to be an optimist. And I think you can you can have a far better day if you do that, especially with the fluctuations we have in the recruitment sector. And then linking off the sort of opt optimism piece, I suppose, is opportunism. Um, mm. You know, you look at the, the thing about the recruitment sector, the thing about the world we live in, there's continuous changes. It's evolving and moving and up and down, et cetera. Whenever there's a change, there's an opportunity. And what most people focus on when there's a change is where it's all going wrong. What have I lost? Why is it different from what it was yesterday? I look at it as, well, if it's changed, there's something else is happening. There's opportunity to go after. Um, so to me, I think the difference between a good recruiter, average recruiter, you know, what's the tool in your toolkit? They just look for opportunity. They seek them out um, and they're positive about the market, irrespective of what the markets are doing. They're optimistic about it. Love that. And... Totally agree with you. Mindset is, you know, as Tony Robbins says so much, I think it's like 80% of business is mindset, 20% is strategy. Have you ever come across a recruiter with a crappy mindset and help mm -hmm. them increase or seen what they've done to, to develop a better mindset? Are there any kind of things that you've seen recruiters do or any tips you can give people just to develop a stronger mindset? Yeah, you see, I've seen a lot of recruiters recently, actually, in the last six to 12 months who their mind's been in the wrong place because it's a very, very different market for what they're used to. And if you think about it, if you look at the post-COVID boom that we're in, that we, we were in, um, a lot of recruiters joined the industry in that boom. So they're used to this beautiful market where you pick up the phone and client give you 100 jobs. You mm. know, it's all, it's all very easy. It's 28% margins. It's retainers. It's blah, 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 blah. We've now that market shifted at the back end of last year. We're now in a bit more of a normalized market. It's not bad. It's just a different market and more normal. Um, so a lot of people don't know how to handle that. They're not used to it. Mm. So I wouldn't say they've necessarily got a bad mindset. I just think they're a little bit confused about understanding where the opportunity is and what good looks like. So, you know, how do you get people to do that? I mean, I, I'm a big fan of trying to get people to focus on their true potential. I think mm. we often benchmark ourselves on what we did yesterday or last month or last quarter, as opposed to what we could be doing. Um, in every market, there's so much more that you could be doing. So, um, yeah, get, getting people to focus on their true potential and where that is, and then basically trying to build a roadmap to get there, I think it is important. Love that, James. Um, 
So one of the things I know that you are brilliant at is kind of keeping your ear close to the ground, if that's the right saying, and you just know what's going on in the market. You speak to a lot of recruitment agencies and recruit recruiters in general. And I know one thing they love to hear is kind of what's going on in the market and and what to do to improve or be better. So from yeah. what you're observing, what are the recruit what recruitment companies, what types of recruitment companies are really standing out at the moment and what are they doing differently to kind of um be above the rest at the moment in this current market, do you think? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So again, if you go back to what I was saying before, the market shifted at the back end of last year. One of the things that we found is a lot of recruiters, a lot of recruitment companies as the market shifted, were actually, when they really, when they look at their business, were being a little bit complacent. So mm. they were busy, 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 billing, running around the place, making loads of cash, which is all great. But the reality is because they were so busy, they stopped doing some of the basic stuff that they should have been doing. You know, we talk about doing the basics brilliantly and consistently. And a lot of those basic things got ignored. and They certainly weren't being consistent. So um, that came back and bit quite a few people on the backside for a, for a few months as they tried to play catch up a little bit and trying to figure out what was going on. What's now happened, and I think this is actually really exciting, is that a lot of recruitment businesses are going through this process called optimization or Certainly all the companies that we work with at TRN, we're pushing through this optimization process where we're basically saying, look, let's just take a big step back. Let's look at our businesses for a second. Look at our recruiters, look at our desks that we're running and say, actually, honestly, are we running in a suboptimal way? Um, could we improve our efficiencies, our capacity, our productivity, our performance in how we're working? And I think a lot of people are really starting to utilize that. AI has now turned, turned its head on. AI has been around for decades, but AI has now popped up and is everywhere. So everyone's now basically going, well, actually, how can I use tech and AI and automations to give me more capacity to make me more productive. Some people are getting that wrong. Some people are getting it right. We'll talk about that, I'm sure, um, as we go in this conversation. But you know, for me, what the really good recruiters doing now? They're going, all right. Well, let me. Let's just take a step back. Let's just look at our our businesses as a machine, and let's make sure our machines are really running as they should be. Um, because for, for the past couple of years, they haven't been. And I think now we're starting to see an evolution of far more uh, productive, higher performance um greater capacity recruitment businesses which i think is really really quite cool when you build on that when you add in the market that's flipping and turning and coming quite positive again and we, i think i i do honestly think we're going to see a boom market in in 2024 um i think you add all that together on top of a, an optimized machine you can absolutely kill it which is sort of really really quite cool then that, that starts manifesting itself into, okay, I've got a really cool machine that's purring and firing up on all cylinders and we can just drive, 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 which is awesome. I've got to make sure now that all the people involved in the business believe in that, buy into it and set their bar higher than, than they have been. So there's been a massive focus around high performance cultures. So taking our businesses, looking at the culture, is uh, deciding whether our cultures are really fit for purpose and saying, well, if they're not, we've got an opportunity to change. Let's change it. Let's create the cultures that we need to have in a business that's going to be able to truly capitalize, maximize on a, any market, but certainly on a growth market when it when it sort of rears its head again. So I think for me, that that's what the big focus has been, is tightening stuff up, super optimizing their businesses, getting the mindset back into high-performing cultures. Obviously, we can talk about all the other stuff, maybe doing business development a hell of a lot better, a little bit more strategically, probably properly, let's call it, and all those bits from that sort of thing. But those two, two areas to me, optimization and high-performing cultures, have been the real drivers, I think, of the strategy for the last six months. And I think we'll pay dividends for people over the next sort of six to 12 months. Interesting. I would love to cover just two things in what you said there. Um Earlier on, on this in, in in your reply, you talked about the fundamentals that a lot of recruiters were kind of skipping over. Um, what were some of those fundamentals that people were getting complacent on, uh, James? If you don't me asking, no, no, not at all. So, I mean, let's start with the obvious one, which is business development, because obviously BED has been the top of everyone's agendas recently because everyone's a lot of people have had a, a sort of a, a limiting job flow coming through. Um, when you look at business development at its core, it comes fundamentally down to getting in front of customers and having meaningful conversations with customers. You can pick up business as a recruiter over the telephone or over an email fairly easily. That's not that difficult to do, really, if you, if you do enough of it. Um, but you won't be bringing in quality business. You won't necessarily be bringing business in that's been given to you exclusively or on a retained basis by the customer. Um, you probably won't really know how to solve the biggest issues that sit behind the reason why the customer's giving you that job in the first place. So therefore, you can't really solve it. So to me, getting in front of customers has always been the number one central point of any sales strategy 
um, face to face and or Zoom or Teams now because we live in a bit more of a virtual world. Um, that's one example of where recruiters have just stopped seeing customers. So we've started to become a bit of a faceless industry from that perspective. The challenge with that is when you start really driving technology into the industry, into the agenda, um, if people start questioning whether it's worthwhile even using a recruiter because I've got this tech to do the job for me. You don't even bother coming to see me anymore or speak to me. I just get an email from you. So actually, who are you? Are you just a, a, another AI bot that's sitting behind a, a face? I don't know. So for me, it's about the basic stuff. And one of the basics is about getting in front of customers. It always has been in, in sales. Mm. Um, I don't know how a recruiter could do their job properly unless they've met a customer. I really don't. Mm. Mm. Yeah, really interesting. I think we've heard that's been a common theme for our conversations as well. Do you have a particular area of BD? I'm sure you're using multi-channels or you promote various things, uh, Jen, but do you stand behind a particular method or strategy or way of working to get your front yourself in front of new customers do you advise a particular area or do you have multiple that you advise your clients yeah so, so we, we we advise our customers on a channel strategy so a multi-channel strategy 16 different channels um mm. so if you look wow. at the sales if you look at the sales pipeline or sales workflow um you basically your job is to drive people and traffic down through the workflow at the top of the workflow i think there are up to about 16 different channels so different 16 different methodologies that recruiters should be running concurrently at any one time the great um, thing about automations and tech is that you can do a lot of that stuff without having to actually be there and do it. So that stuff can be running in the background. And some of the stuff is a little bit left field. Some of it's quite you know unique. Some of it's fairly standard. You know, some of it's very obvious. You know, things like podcasting strategies. You know, everybody's doing podcasts at the moment. And I, I love that as a concept. I think it's great. The reality is I don't think people understand the value of a podcast from a sales point of view. So a lot of people do podcasting because it creates content, yeah, which is brilliant. And the content we can share and learn, it's good for marketing and brand and et cetera. I totally get that. Wonderful result. It's a byproduct for me because I look at it from a point of view of if you gave me a list of 10 decision makers from customers I want to do business with and you asked me to cold call them and try and pitch them right now. If I'm lucky, I might have a 10% success rate. I might get through to one and convince and have a meeting with me. Um, and I like to think I'm reasonably okay at, at BD. Um, however, if you gave me that same list of 10 customers and I invited them onto a podcast because we're talking about a particular subject and they are the experts that have been identified that should be talking about it, I'll probably have close to 75% conversion rate. So, you know, to me, I look at podcasting as a brilliant BD strategy. We look at it from a marketing content point of view. I think that as a byproduct of actually what the real point of it is. So, so that's, the, that's an example channel strategy. I think fairly obvious, but I don't think people necessarily utilize it in that way. It's really clever. Yeah. It's really, it's simple, but it absolutely makes sense. I think me and Sam were talking about this and um, the amount of people that are willing to come on a podcast is unbelievable. It, I mean, obviously I think you have to build up some sort of a brand or I'm, I'm sure it gets a little bit easier once you've got an established brand in the market. But it is quite amazing how many people are willing to speak about themselves. And so I can see that being a very powerful avenue to start conversations and increase conversions. Um, Definitely. If, if you think if you think about one of the biggest drivers of personal motivation is about being a master and like mastery in your subject and your topic. Mm, mm. If you're a master, if you're a true master, being invited onto a podcast to talk about your craft, you know, like you're doing to me today, I suppose. A is incredibly flattering, so thank you. Um, B, it's great exposure for me and my personal brand. Thank you again. And thirdly, actually, at the end of the day, I'm going to finish this podcast and go, actually, maybe I do know some stuff, you know. So maybe <laughs> I am actually a bit of a master in my craft. I'm, I'm not saying that sounds arrogant, but you get the idea. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So it, it ticks a lot of boxes off, I think, and people love it. So, And we're so used now to being in a podcasting world where, you know, every morning we wake up, we listen to a webinar or a podcast while we're cleaning your teeth or having breakfast it's a standard thing now so um yeah i think that that's an example but it, that's just one very simple basic channel i wouldn't mm. say you rely on that quite the opposite but you imagine running that concurrently with all the other channels and actually it's quite interesting yeah Absolutely. i just want people listening now to take that strategy on board because i think a lot of people's perceptions of podcasts is that you have to build up a huge you know audience for it to bring something back in terms of monetary gain but your strategy there james which is you know build a podcast, give it a name and start inviting your target customers onto it. You know, that's a great way to start conversation. So if anyone's listening now and doubting the process of podcasting, try that out. I think that's a really great tip. In terms of the, you mentioned 16 channels, James, that's a lot of channels. I think, you know, the more the merrier, definitely me and Ben are big advocates of using multi-channel approaches. If a recruiter was like, whoa, 16, I can only use like three or four until I'm overwhelmed. What would be your top three or four that you, you would recommend out of those 16, do you think? 
it really depends on your markets. And I wouldn't say that you would just depend on three or four. I think where, where business development goes wrong is when you look at BD as something that I have to do. I'm a recruiter at a desk. I have to do BD. BD is a company-wide strategy. Mm. So, you know, five or six of those channel strategies will be owned by your marketing division or your outsourced marketing partner. Um, they, you know, any marketing, any marketing function in a recruitment company, if you can't measure the return on investment you're getting from that marketing function, then you shouldn't have it in your business. It's as simple as that. So um, for me, I look at that as a very clear sales strategy. Marketing often sits separate from from sales. To me, it's part of the sales pipeline. In fact, it sits above the, the top of the sales pipeline. So, you know, marketing would drive five or six of those different channel strategies. What most recruiters tend to do is they, they tend to have one and they get this, their go-to one and they stick to it. Like I spec out candidates, I reverse market candidates all day long. Mm. Does that work? It could work depending on the marketplace. I wouldn't necessarily rely on it. Uh, I certainly wouldn't be my only strategy, that's for sure. Um, and I would certainly try try and automate that as much as I possibly can. So it wouldn't take up much of my time to be able to do that. Um, we've got a really good strategy running at the moment with some of the members and some of the recruiters we're working with around their outreach video strategy. And mm. so about how do you actually do a proper outreach campaign with video content that you're creating, but not just the bland, same old, same old type of stuff. So it's a little bit different. Um, so I really love that. We've got some great strategies running around insight sales. Um, so how are you getting a recruiter to build a data center of insights and information to take to market or flaunt in front of the marketplace That's as part of the channel strategy? So, you know, it's like me saying to Ben, you know, Ben, um, just before this call, I spoke to five of your best mates and they told me something about you that you don't know. Do you want to know? And you're going to probably <laughs> say, yeah. Um, you know, and that's Absolutely. the concept, that's the concept behind insight selling, right? Is I've got some information, some unique information or insights about your market, about what's going on, about your business. Love to sit down and tell you about what that is. Do you want to know what it is? You know, let's, let's get a call. So there's a whole insight sales approach that sits behind that as well. So there's loads of them, there's different things. We've got some great stuff initiatives going on around community building. Um, so recruiters building proper talent communities and client communities now, um, where in essence, if you imagine them as two circles, a recruiter sort of sitting in that middle sort of concentric the bit where they cross over. I've got an amazing talent community of, of candidates, of engaged candidates who are passively or actively looking for work. I've got an amazing community of clients who are talking about the market changes and what's going on. I, as a recruiter, own those communities and sit in the middle and help you meet um, cross over. That's a brilliant strategy. But then you've got to run a proper community out of the back of that. You can't just dabble at it or stick up a Slack group. You've got to build a proper community that works and functions and it evolves and is engaging and, and et cetera, et cetera. So there's lots of different strategies, lots of different ideas. And um, you know, we have a, we have a, a channel strategy guide that we share with members uh, to allow them to pick maybe half a dozen and say, let's start with those and just get really damn good at those six first and then mm. then build and build and build from there. Really interesting. I love the two two that stick out for me. I'm sure they're all equally as effective for different recruiters. The two that I love, video, that's been highly effective for us, you know, just using interesting video follow-ups and campaigns and insight, insight campaigns. I think that's fascinating. I haven't heard yeah. that before, uh, James, in terms of a recruiter or recruiters building campaigns on a basic level, but it sounds like you're on quite the advanced stage of, you know, providing insights. Because when we did market research, a lot of our customers go back to their customers and ask, what do they want to hear about? What content would you find interesting? If we were to post, what would you want to listen to? Pretty much all of them said insights from the market, what my competitors are doing. Those are the two yep. biggest things that came up every single time. So I can imagine that being really effective. That's that's really interesting. 100%. I was on a call this morning with a, with a, one of the members and we were talking about what their recruiters are currently doing. And they're saying they're, finding really, they're trying to penetrate a European market. They're saying they're really struggling at the moment to get any traction. And I said, why? And they said basically because every other recruiter all day long is just specking CVs into these clients at the moment. That's all they're doing. So it's just how the hell do you differentiate yourself when you've got 30 emails coming into a decision maker who's got one job, 30 people with CVs, have probably got the same CVs, half of them as well. It's all exactly the same. So there's nothing wrong with specking candidates in. I totally get that as a concept. But if that's all you're relying on, that's a real hard slog you've got ahead of you. So we've got to think differently about these. And I think one of the great skills of a great recruiter, I suppose it goes back to one of the earlier questions about what's in your toolkit, is empathy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, really good recruiters just stop for a second and think, what the hell, the person I'm about to talk to or engage with on the telephone, email, however, what are they currently doing? So I, I'm going to interrupt them. Whatever they're doing, I'm now going to interrupt them. This is better be bloody good. Otherwise, that is an annoyance as opposed to anything that's actually worth adding value. So a great question for any recruiters listening to this today to, to ask themselves is just before you engage with the customer, telephone face to face. Are you going to end up in the next 30 seconds annoying them because you've interrupted their day and then whatever they're in the middle of doing? 
or are you going to add some value to their life in the next 30 seconds if you're going to annoy them don't even pick up the phone not worth it because all you're doing is damaging your reputation you're on a bit of a spiraling one of those false economies where great news i've ticked off another kpi i've done another sales call you haven't actually you've actually just basically annoyed someone Mm, yeah (laughs) I i love that going in with value on the sales call i know everyone says that but it's so true and and, I, and I'm guessing, James, using things like the data that you mentioned, you know, turning up on the call and saying, hey, I've got some competitor analysis that might be interesting. Would you like to hear it? That would be a way of interest, uh, uh, instantly providing some form of value on the call. Is that kind of where you're going with that? Yeah, certainly one example. Absolutely. But, you know, yeah. ultimately, ultimately, you know, if you empathize with something, it's like, it's like me sitting here now. If, if someone suddenly picked up the phone, and it was a cold call on my phone. I'm in the middle of this. I've got a, I, since I finished, I've got a board meeting in 10 minutes straight after our call. Bam, 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 bam. You know, I've got 10 minutes to probably go and nip off to the bathroom and get a cup of tea or something. Someone picks up the phone and says, hey, it's like so-and-so for a recruiter. Do you want to buy from me today? We want all these awards. Like, are you kidding me? No, not really. And do you mind? <laughs> I'm actually bloody busy. So, yeah. so, so actually, that's not going to wash with me. And I think we've got to really up our game with that type of stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, really interesting. Um, I'm just going to jump in, Sam, if you don't mind. I know yeah, you course, wanted to ask ahead. a question, but <laughs> we always have this, James, jumping in. Um, That's right, you're trends. You can do that. <laughs> <laughs> you talked about um, optimization. You said one of the things that some of the best recruiters are doing, they're standing back, looking at their business, and they're optimizing. Have you found one particular area or a particular area that's having the biggest impact in terms of optimization at the moment for businesses? Well, um, it, again, it sort of depends on where your business is not performing at full capacity, I suppose, is, is the answer to that question, which is probably not the answer you're looking for. But so if, if I give you the, take a big step back, what do we do when we go into a company? We look at their business and go, right, let's pull your business apart and turn it into a, a series of workflows. So every recruitment company, even the recruiter's desk, is basically a bunch of workflows. I've got a business development workflow. I've got a marketing workflow that sits above that. I've got a BD workflow. I've got a delivery workflow. I've got an account penetration workflow. And a workflow is basically, these are the seven, six things that I do to get a customer who doesn't know me to know me or get a customer who now knows me to buy from me or a customer who's buying from me to buy more from me or a customer who's given me a job to deliver on that job. These are the steps I follow. So if you broke down in this basic format, a recruitment company, it could be 46 steps. Let's just keep it as a, from a simple point of view if you to write them all together. So then you look at those 46 steps and go, right, let's start measuring conversion ratios across each of those different steps. So again, if you can't measure the conversion ratios, you sort of question why is that step in your workflow? You look at those conversion ratios and go, okay, well, okay, these are the current conversion ratios. Let's now benchmark that against best practice and what other recruitment companies are doing, which is why people join the recruitment network because we have good insights into what everyone else is up to. Um, so let's benchmark what other people are up to. Let's look at maybe what you could be doing, what good looks like. Let's maybe look at what you were doing last month and see if it's better than that etc cetera, etc cetera. let's get a sense actually of where the areas are from there you do a thing called tweak performance where um, you identify half a dozen areas and you go right in the next 30 days or in the next 90 day sprint that we're, we're working on i'm going to pick five or six of those areas and i'm going to tweak them by two three four five percent so my conversion from calls to meetings from meetings to jobs on to cv send uh to second interview whatever the whatever they are from new clients to customer lifetime value so it increases the value of that customer all these conversions if i increase one of those by two or three percent if imagine it on an excel spreadsheet i can actually tell you the impact you would have at the bottom and much from my performance point of view and i love that as a concept it's brilliant when you actually show someone that because they can start going okay i don't need to change everything i really really don't what i need to do is focus on two or three areas in the next 90 days if i improve those tweak 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 by two or three four five percent I can throw in an extra 20, 30 grand to the bottom line of my desk in this quarter, or I can do an extra 100K in, in the EBIT across the, across the quarter, across five, a team of five, or whatever it is. And it's brilliant when you start looking at the business like that. And that's where this optimization piece comes in, because you know, imagine recruitment as like a conveyor belt. Yeah, you're, you're basically you're building a, a product, you're building the product, you're turning the product, you're putting it into a packaging up into a box, you're sending the product out at the other end. If it takes me an extra, or sorry, if it's if it takes me a, ten seconds less at the front end to build the product, I can probably get an extra thirty products on my conveyor belt in the next ten minutes, type thing. Mm-hmm. Imagine the impact that has all the way down to the other end about how many deal, how many products I can therefore get off my conveyor belt at the other end and, and sent out. And that's the concept of a recruitment company: lots and lots of workflows. You tweak two or three areas of it, it improves significantly at the other end. 
And that tweak can change everything in the business and everything. And we often, we often talk a lot in recruitment about, I'm, I'm rattling on here, sorry. And we often talk a lot in recruitment about, you know, when we talk about underperformers, we go like, there's a bunch of people in my business that are currently underperforming. Why? What we never look at or hardly ever look at is, is it the customer's fault that this consultant is underperforming? So are they working with certain customers in a certain way that actually means their conversion ratios at the part of the funnel process or the workflow is dropping off? Um, what can we do to improve that? A classic example of being how many recruiters actually measure on a month, week by week, month by month basis, the speed it takes for a customer to come back to them on CVs. Now we talk about mm-hmm. it a lot. I'm going to go, oh, they're a bit slow. Blah, blah, blah. What's the actual measurement? Do we then say, right, to our customers, well, we know for me to be able to do my job properly and convert at the level I should be, that optimized level I should be, a customer must come back to me within 38, 36 hours of me sending through a CV. Otherwise, anything after that means we're going to get increase in dropouts and increase in slippage, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we go to the customer and say, right, if we're going to work with you, your KPI, Mr. Customer, is you have 36 hours to come back to us on a CV. If you don't, I can't do my job properly. Mm. I might even penalize you. I might even send you a bill for wasting my time. So that's the way that we should be thinking about it. That's part of the workflow. The customer is part of that journey as well. Brilliant. Yeah, I love that. I think that's all about having clear non-negotiables, isn't it, James, with the clients that you have initial calls with. We we had a um, lovely lady called uh, Amber Penrose. She's an 800K biller. And she said that one of the biggest things she did was set clear non-negotiables with her clients. And that was one of the biggest things that moved the needle forward to kind of yeah. fish out the clients who were serious and the ones that weren't and therefore made a bill a lot more. So I really yeah, love that. Definitely. And apologies, I haven't heard that. But I imagine Amber, when you talk to her, she talks probably more in the language of these these, these customers are my partners as opposed to yes, a, I'm, not, I'm, not a I'm not a supplier to them. So yes, we have an objective here, which is to make a placement in your business. It's, it's a benefit for you. It's a benefit for me. So let's work together to figure out the best way of doing this. If, a, if that workflow breaks down at any point, Someone's responsible for that. It ain't going to achieve the objective we want. So we're a partnership. I'm not a supplier to you. You work with me as a partner, equal footing. We can do this. Yeah. How do you, because I feel like that is one of the biggest things that recruiters struggle with is, is being perceived or ma- trying to, yeah, trying to be perceived as a partner to their clients and, and being able to confidently persuade them or, or show that they have the expertise to become a partner. How, how, how can recruit? How can recruiters go um, go about doing that in a better way? Do you think, James? Have you have you seen any success stories or people that have kind of completely changed their value proposition? Is there anything that you've seen to help them do yeah. that in a better way? Yeah, there's lots of ways of doing it. I mean, the root cause of it is, is what we call subservience. So we, we mm-hmm. automatically position ourselves as below a customer. You know, I'm a 20, I'm not, but I wish I was. I'm a 23 year old recruiter. This is my sort of second job out of uni. Um, you know, I'm doing Python development recruitment. Don't know much about Python, but I'm learning as I go sort of stuff. I'm about to deal with some sort of 45 CT, 45 year old CTO who's been doing this for years etc what how you know really a poly, like, so sorry to interrupt you so sorry to bother mm. you would you mind possibly we, we approach it with a real subservient footing straight away we, we've got to stop doing that we really have to stop doing that it kills our business right from the very very, very beginning you need to go to your customers and be really really clear the value that you can add to them and you need to believe in that value if you don't believe in that value yourself then there's no point you picking up the phone in the first place so there's a real belief system that sits behind that about the value that we offer. Um, there's a real belief system. I think that we are, as I said, partners rather than the suppliers. Now, I would never work as a recruiter, as a supplier to my customers. I just don't see the point of doing that because you're treated differently. You They work with you in different ways. The margins are different. It all just goes wrong as far as I'm concerned. When you're a partner, it's completely different. So then that comes into, well, what are you selling? So are you selling supplier services or partnership products to customers? If you're selling partnership products, it's a very different product from a supplier thing. Um Having true belief that actually as a recruiter, how on earth can you do your job properly if you're working with a customer who's keeping you arms distant, um, mm. who's working with you with 15 other agencies at the same time on a contingent basis? I can't physically solve the problems that you've the reason why. And I mentioned this before. You now, customers come to us with a, they, they use agencies because they can't do it themselves. Mm. And there's an issue. There's a reason behind that. So just by flicking a job out to hundreds of, of agencies is not necessarily going to solve their problem. It's just going to get lots of other people working on the same problem, but not fixing it. Whereas if you actually sit down with an agency or a recruiter and go, right, let's look at the issue. What's causing this issue. It might be something simple as 
Um, my brand, our business as an organization, our brand is not strong enough to attract the right level of talent within the marketplace. So just by doing lots of running around trying to recruit for you is not going to solve that problem. But helping you build an EVP or brand campaign first as part of the solution will probably help solve that problem. Now, I'm not going to do that on a contingent basis, but I'll damn well do that on a retained basis. So a recruiter needs to wake up in the morning and literally say to themselves, how am I going to be able to fix my customers' problems if mm-hmm. they're making me work as a supplier, as a subservient supply, arms distant relationship? I think it's really, really hard to do. So a recruiter needs to wake up and go confidently, I'm bloody good at what I do. This is why I'm here. I'm a catalyst for you as an organization to be able to grow your business and move forward. And there's there's only one real way that you can work with me. And that's basically as in a partnership model. I may not know all the answers because I'm still junior to this particular role, um, but I'll go and find out the answers for you. But also, I need to make sure you're on side with me so we can work together and collaborate to get this job done to solve your problems. Otherwise, it won't work. Love that. So that I got belief systems is like the main pillar there, James. I think it also comes down, which you alluded to, is understanding the problems of your customers and asking better questions. I think that kind of ties into it as well. Um, yeah, well, it is. And a big thing is around, well, there's a big thing around positioning on this, right? And I'll give you an mm-hmm. example of this. So when I was a recruiter, I used to work in the Australian market many years ago. And I was a recruiter in the Aussie market. I worked in Sydney. And I would do a classic day would be like five or six client meetings in a day. So yeah, I literally get in my car and I drive around different parts of Sydney and New South Wales to go and visit clients. And what I could be in a meeting with a company that's a, a bank. And then half an hour later, I might be having a meeting with a guy who manufactures fridges and his warehousing in north ride or wherever it was and um you know what i trained myself to do and i mean this genuinely i didn't do this as some sort of clever sales trick i really generally did this i wanted to enjoy my job was i trained myself to get interested in everything Mm. that my customers were doing so if i'm walking into a a guy a company that manufactures fridges for that moment i am going to be absolutely obsessed with fridges and it sounds like a real fake thing to say i'm not being fake i generally just got really excited and interested Mm. about it so rather than having a meeting with that customer in their meeting room at the front of the building, I'd stop them right from the very beginning and say, just before we start this meeting, could you just show me around your warehouse? Mm. Could you show me around the fridges? And they're like, why are you wearing a suit? Well, why do you want to come look at my fridges? That's weird. I said, because I need to understand, <laughs> I need to understand what exactly is this product that these people are coming in to manufacture, build, deliver, sell, whatever it might be. And then you're walking around this, this, this warehouse with your hard hat on or whatever, looking at fridges, getting excited about fridges. This is a bad example. You get the idea. Um, but for that moment, I am genuinely interested in that customer's business. So to me, that is about positioning. And if you do that right, your customers buy into you and you genuinely buy into the customer's proposition as well. I can now go back to my my candidates and confidently sell that fridge manufacturing business. I've been in the warehouse. I wasn't just stuck in some stuffy meeting room at the front. Recruiters need to have the desire and the want and the ability to get out of people's meeting rooms um, and get into their boardrooms or get into their warehouses or get into the, the heart of their business. If you think like that, brilliant Uh, you can do anything in recruitment absolutely love that i feel like that is like a little piece of gold that every recruiter should be because there's so many people that i've spoken to that just haven't taken any interest in the business in the businesses that they're serving and i can i can feel it you know when i ask them questions they they just don't really know anything and they haven't taken the initiative to ask better questions and and be curious is where i'm getting it i think what you trained yourself to do james would be was was to become naturally curious about the other person and then that yeah. gets you more excited, doesn't it? But I think that's to approach every business like that. I think that's absolute gold. I absolutely love that. Well, look, look, look at the quality of some of the job ads are going out. You know, half the time they're just really bland details, data. That's it. No one's selling the opportunity. No one's going like, forget the job spec, forget the salary. Look at this company. It's amazing. I was there. It's a picture of me standing there. I'm going to go back to my fridges now with the fridge. Right? <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't need recruiters are listening to this who are actually recruiting the fridge world. You know, you're, if you do, you're going to kill it now, I'll tell you. But, you know, but, but, that, but that's the reality, right? You know, so we need yeah. to be able to go to market and sell the brand, sell the company, sell the opportunity. The data is there underneath it. If I need to find the, the salary, it's all there. But you can't do that unless you're at the heart of the business and you've touched it, tasted it, felt it. Mm, absolutely love that, mate. Um, I was um, skimming through your posts and I realized that you you speak a lot about um, be not being mediocre and kind of striving to be better. Mm-hmm. And I and I absolutely love that. I don't think enough people are speaking about that, firstly. But secondly, I think it ties into mine and Ben's ethos as well, which is always, you know, 
we want to be experts in our field. We want to be the best. We don't want to be average. That scares the crap out of me and Ben just to be average. Um, mm-hmm. What is the definition of being mediocre in your eyes, James? When you speak about this, like, what do you think of mediocrity, and and what is it? What does it mean to you? Of interest, uh, accepting the status quo. It's as simple as that. So you know, accepting that enough. I've done enough. That's enough for today. And that sort of thing. I, I just don't understand that concept. And that's built into me and how I like to behave. I, I have this thing in my, in my life. It's terrible, actually. Um, I call it being positively discontent. It's, a, it's like a disease I've got. Um, and um, it means I'm, I'm not very good at celebrating success because I, 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 if something happens, something good, we win, we grow, we achieve, we've outperformed, we hit a record month. I go, brilliant. But what's next? And I immediately think about what's the next, what's the next piece. So for me, it's all about doing the thing. I, I do quite a lot of, um, and this is going to sound like people know me. I always try and drop this into any any podcast I talk about. Um, I've done a couple of Ironman triathlon um, <laughs> and nice. an ultra an ultra run. I do it for charity. It's a bit of fun. And I'm an old man. Nice. So it's like, why not give it a go, right? Yeah, but the, yeah. um, but the, the one of the reasons why I do it, I like to see how far I can push myself. I, mm. I love that feeling of when you hit the wall, what do you do? You hit a wall, you're on a run, you hit a wall, do you stop? Do you give up? Do you sulk? Or do you go, do you know, do you know what? I'm just going to punch through that wall and go again. And you know that you could always punch through that wall and go again and go harder and go faster and go stronger. So I love that as a concept in my personal life. I think in business, it's the same thing. If you start accepting that enough is enough, then people could argue that means you're happy with what you've got and you can focus on the today and all that sort of stuff. And I get all that. Of course I do. Um, I personally like to sort of think, what else could I get next? It keeps me moving forward, keeps me striving. And I love that feeling of continuity. When I, I did a run, we did a, an ultra marathon a couple of, um, a couple of months ago, it's a hundred K ultra marathon. It's the toughest thing I've ever done. And um, when I finished it the week after I felt so depressed, it was unbelievable because I, mm. I basically built up this thing and I finished it and then that was it. I was just, I mm. literally had depression all over me. It was awful. Wow. So I I had to find something else to now go for. Otherwise I'm just going to be depressed. And maybe I am a sad bloke. I don't know, but you know, that was the, that was the reality behind that. And and, so, and I bring that, I try and bring that into business as well, which means I'm, ne- I'm never really happy if I'm honest. Um, mm. I'm, a, I'm a happy bloke, but I'm never really content with what I've got. Is that a bad thing? I don't know, but it does keep me always moving forward, always thinking about what's next, what I quite like. Yeah, absolutely love that. So funny when I when you listen to like some of the top CEOs in the world, that seems to be the common thing is like striving, never really content, still happy, but never really quite content and always striving to do to do more. It's, it's a really interesting that you say that um, you said that me- being mediocre could be is probably draining for some people. Mm. What, what <laughs> I, I didn't really get that. Um, can you explain what you meant by that? Why, why do you think it's draining for some people? You know, you know, you know that feeling when you, you've been at work all day, you've had a really, really full on day and you've thrown everything at it. You've been in, a, in what we call flow state. You've been in a state of flow. You've achieved stuff. You've put everything in it. You haven't even, you didn't even realize, but you just missed breakfast, lunch and dinner. One mm. of those sorts of days. You go back home, you can literally go again. You feel so pumped up. You can go again. And I love that feeling. I think that feeling is brilliant. I know a lot of people who go to work and they just scroll through the day. They just get through the day type of stuff. They're clock watching by 10 o'clock. They're just getting the stuff ticked off to keep their boss off their back and the KPIs, et cetera. When they leave, they feel absolutely exhausted. They feel mm. really, really tired. And there's that draining feeling. And, I, and I'm absolutely convinced that if you – if, 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 what what creates energy in a person is completion, is fulfillment, is growth. You know, people talk about like purpose and achieving your purpose. I think the more you do that, the more related you feel, the more energy you have. I, t- I see it people all the time in at sports and, and outside of sport and business and everything else. I think when you haven't really got a purpose, when you haven't really, f- when you don't feel like you're achieving anything, you're just getting through stuff. I think that's really tiring, and I think people mm. mentally emotionally and probably feel that that then manifests itself into probably physical and tiredness as well i think so so to me i suppose you know is it why is it draining i think it's just emotionally it feels like you're in a state of uh, almost like a static state um mm. and i think i think people find that tiring i, I personally do I, I know i do definitely mm. i'm sure you've had more experience with this uh james but i find it almost impossible with someone who has a mediocre mindset it's so difficult to shift that because i almost feel like it's this thing that's been developed from childhood or from some sort of traumatic experience or something really important in their life have you like am i right in saying that it's, it's almost impossible to transform that mediocre mindset or have you done it successfully before with recruiters like 
What's your what's your opinion on that? Yeah, definitely not impossible. And I'm not saying I've got the the, the, the sort of the golden ticket for this because if I had, you know, I'd be working with all sorts of different organisations that are making millions and millions and millions of pounds overnight. But you know, the the reality is, I think anybody can change. Anybody mm. can change if you want to. So yeah. you've got to understand what is it that drives you, your wants. You know, why would you want to change? Why bother changing? If I'm in the state of averageness, mediocrity, if I'm I'm fine and I'm getting away from it, then and I'm comfortable with that, then why would I need to change? And you've got to understand, you've got to find that thing in there that gives you a reason to change. It could be a monetary thing, a financial thing. It could be a personal growth thing. It could be, I mean, there's thousands of things it could be. For everyone, it's different. We talk a lot about what motivates people, what motivates recruiters. Everybody always talks about financials. You know, you, you almost look, you almost like, if you say on a podcast like this, I don't think it's a, every recruiter is financially motivated. You get shot down overnight because it must be, we're a sales industry. Of course I get that. And of course we're out to make commission and all that sort of, of course it is. But 90% of the recruiters I talk to aren't driven by money. It's a mm. part of the process, but it's not the driving thing. And if you as a leader can find out what is that thing that drives that, that motivation of your, of your team, if you as an individual can unearth what is your real motivation, and that's what you hang your hat on, that's what you focus on, you can definitely change. You can definitely change overnight. And I think that's a really exciting thing about, I think it's an exciting thing about life is that life is a, is a continuous evolution and a continuous change. Um, I always say to people, it's not what, it's not the, the circumstances you're in. It's not the change that, that affects you. It's how you react to the change mm-hmm. and, how, and how you respond to it. So when the proverbial hits the fan, when things get rough, when we, we saw it over COVID, how do people respond to it? Some people went in their shell some people panic etc some people said it is what it is how do we make this into the best possible thing it could be and a lot of people did a really good job of that so it's, it's your response rate which i think is important so long answer to your question ben like all my answers but you know i, I do think people can change definitely it all yeah. comes down to the reason for change if you can mm-hmm. identify that you will change yeah fascinating yeah. and i yeah I agree with you. I think I'm being a bit of a pessimist on this uh, in this podcast, but um, you said that 90% of recruiters aren't driven by money. Well, it's not their primary motive, which I completely understand and agree with. What What's the most common thing that typically crops up when you look at the kind of primary motivators for a lot of recruiters? Is there one thing that crops up more than others? Well, there's a lot of things. There's been a lot of data being produced around this. We've done our own data about the recruitment sector. There's been data just talked about sort of people individually but you know you've got the hierarchy of needs type structure where people talk about purpose mastery all that type of stuff i think that's absolutely valid i think self-actualization is huge which is that not that thing of people look at me and think i'm great it's actually i go home and like look in the mirror and actually i do think i'm great that mm. self-actualization i think is hugely important otherwise you end up mm. living in this false world where you're pleasing everybody but you don't actually like yourself you don't think you're any good so I think that's really important. Based on our research, when you look at the, some of the reasons why recruiters leave and move jobs and why they're attracted to other agencies, a lot of that comes down to their growth potential, their ability to learn, their ability to go move up the food chain. Again, that's that sort of mastery piece and that evolution of development. Um, I think they're big, big drivers as much as anything else. Um, one of the biggest, I think, intrinsic um drivers of motivation in any recruiter, in any sales-driven industry, is that you feel like you're part of a winning team. Um, mm-hmm. I think that that is huge. So again, you know, how do we install that within our people? Um, that high performance culture I mentioned before is that it's all about we're continuously winning and improving. I think people want to be part of that. Um, mm-hmm. When you when you're part of that high performance winning team, you start to forget about some of the small things that annoyed you yesterday. They're not as important anymore because actually they're not important. Mm-hmm. Um, so on and so forth. So yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot of things. There's been a lot of data around. A lot of research. So I think. Um, I think people just generally want to be able to go home at night and feel I've done the best job I can. I'm part of a team that seems to be winning and seems to be growing. And I've personally grown and, t- mm. and developed today and I'm con- continuously learning more. Mm. Yeah, that makes so much sense. And um, we're coming to the end of the pod, um, James. We always end with this question. Um, mm-hmm. Cold calling, yes or no? Um, is there a place for it in today's uh, modern world for the recruiter? Um, should they just give it up altogether? Is there is it a balanced thing? What's your opinion on cold calling? Does that have to be a yes or no answer? Can I give no, you it can a, be any no. answer you want. <laughs> okay, 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 cool. Um, we need to be picking up the telephone 100 times more than we are today. And we need to be getting in meetings 100 times more than we are today. That, that's number one. So that, that's been around in our industry since the beginning and it doesn't change and it won't ever go away. We're a human industry and we need to utilize that. The art of cold calling, I think, has changed significantly, though. That's the reality. Um, does cold calling still work? Of course it does. If you bang the phones long enough and hard enough, you'll probably get through and make some deals. Is it the most efficient way of 
uh, running a desk. No, not at all. Um, so we talk a lot about warm calling instead. I'm not just trying to sound facetious and go, there's a slight change in terminology. But the reality is, if I pick up the phone to 100 people who've never heard of me before, completely cold, I might get a 5% success rate if I'm lucky. Um, if, however, I've warmed those customers up first through my automation, through my tech, through my marketing, et cetera, I'm still making the same 100 calls, but they're warm calls now, I'll probably get a 20% success rate. I would much rather make 100 calls and speak to 20 people than make 100 calls and speak to five people properly. So um, has cold calling died? No, not at all. Telephone is still the most important tool in any recruiter's toolkit um, and should be used a lot more. But I think we could be better about who we're calling, how we're calling them, and that process that sits ahead of the call itself. Um, so, yeah, that's my answer. Yes and no. There we go. Great answer. Yeah. Great answer <laughs> Thanks, James. James. May, it was a pleasure to have you on the pod. Thank you so much. Really, really enjoyed it. Pleasure. I really enjoyed it, guys. Thanks, thanks both for inviting me on. I appreciate it. Hey, guys. Thanks for tuning in to this episode. If you enjoyed it, please don't forget to subscribe on YouTube and Spotify. Tune in for another episode next week, and we look forward to seeing you again very soon. Peace and love. <laughs>